I'm Amy Blossom from Jackson County Library Services, and I welcome you to Windows in Time. Windows in Time is a series of local history talks, a program that's been developed by the Jackson County Library Services and Southern Oregon Historical Society. It is also part of the Southern Oregon History Show, which, shows, which airs on Thursday nights at 6 p.m. You can also see us live, though, at the Medford and Ashland Libraries, the first and second Wednesday of each month at noon. So are you ready for some history? Let's go. Hello, my name is Alice Mullally. I'm a longtime mathematics teacher and a lover of local history. As such, I've been a volunteer at the Southern Oregon Historical Society where I write um, as it was radio scripts and where I work in the Southern Oregon Historical Society Research Library. And it was at the Research Library several years ago when I was asked to transcribe a diary in a little tiny notebook that was written by Fletcher Lynn about a trip that he and some Jacksonville people took to Crater Lake in 1889. And it's that diary that I would like to read to you today. Uh, you will see a lot of photographs that they did not take on their trip. So these are photographs that other people took on their trips to Crater Lake. I'd like to start by introducing you to the people who went on this trip. Uh, Fletcher Lynn was the person who wrote the diary. He was the son of David Lynn, who was a pioneer furniture maker in Jacksonville. He'd gone to school in Jacksonville and then on to the University of Oregon, where in 1889 he was to be a senior. He seems not only to be the diarist, but the organizer of this trip as well. Also along was Fletcher's cousin on his mother's side, Carrie Beekman. She was the daughter of Cornelius Beekman, the wealthiest man in Jackson County, a banker, landowner. Carrie was a graduate of Mills College in Oakland, California, and was 24 years old at the time of this trip. She was an accomplished musician. Visiting Carrie that summer was Nina Beekman, Carrie's cousin on the Beekman side from Dundee, New York. Uh, Carrie, on this trip, turns 19. Joining the group from Salem was a classmate of Carrie's from Mills College, Anna Brayman. She was also 24. Her father was a prominent merchant and property owner in Salem. Along on the trip was Cap Kubley, another son of a pioneer family who owned farms, lands, and stores in Jacksonville and the Applegate Valley. Cap was 20 and attending the University of Oregon. Another University of Oregon classmate was Everett Mingus, who was a sophomore, having won one of only two scholarships given by Jackson County in 1888. His father had donated land just six years earlier to the railroad for the founding of Medford. Rounding out the group was Professor G. H. Watt. He was principal of Jacksonville School, where he had been for five years. He was 36 years old and had lost his wife just the year before, leaving him with four very young children. There's no record of how he handled childcare on this trip, however. Was he on this trip as a chaperone? Was he just friendly with recent graduates of Jacksonville High School? Fletcher Lynn doesn't tell us. Now, today, if we went to Crater Lake, we'd grab a sweater and a bottle of water, and we'd be off, and two hours later, we'd be climbing Garfield Peak or going down the trail to the lake to take a boat trip or uh, driving around the Rim Drive, and we'd be home for supper, unless we'd stopped at Becky's and had too much pie, then we wouldn't want supper. But they had a very different trip. And Fletcher Lynn wrote a very interesting and rather charming account of that trip. And we're now going to hear about it in his own words. 
Wednesday, August 7th, 1889. Vehicles were a large wagon for provisions drawn by steady farm horses and carriage drawn by a spirited livery team. This was their means of transportation for the entire trip. Provisions included 30 loaves of bread, two sacks of flour, 35 pounds of sugar. Note that this is five pounds per person for only three weeks. 70 pounds of potatoes, that seems like a lot too. Not so much meat, only three hams and 11 pounds of bacon, but lots of fruit, two watermelons, a box of peaches, and so forth. As well as complete cooking outfit. Ax, hatchet, saw, nails, rope, wire, portable table, camp stools, tents and poles, bedding, and so forth. Hunting implements, two Winchester rifles, a shotgun, a target gun with 800 cartridges, and a revolver. For some reason, Fletcher Lynn doesn't mention fishing gear, and yet he talks about fishing almost every day. They took games, a deck of authors, chess and checkers with board and deck of cards, and musical instruments, cornet, guitar, and three harmonicas left Jacksonville at 6 a.m., ate lunch consisting of ham sandwiches and marble cake at 11 on the bank of Bear Creek, passed through Phoenix, Talent, and Ashland. At Ashland, we remained half an hour to view the principal parts of the city and all the many improvements recently made. The city seems quite lively and prosperous, the population is about 2,000, so they claim. Arrived at Johnny Murphy's place on Immigrant Creek, six miles above Ashland or 23 miles from Jacksonville at four o'clock and pitched camp. Had a fine supper at six, after which we spent the evening in singing, playing games, and so forth. Messrs. Watt and Kubley also interested the crowd in a few gymnastics exercises. Retired at 9.30, all were exceedingly jubilant and anticipated a grand trip and jolly time. Perfect harmony was foreseen and all members of the party seemed nothing but congenial. Thursday, August 8th, arose at 5 a.m., had fine warm breakfast and continued our journey at 716. Roads were not rough, but all uphill. Ladies walked two and a half miles. After being on the road about two hours, Kubli, and roaming about, came in contact with a huge, fierce badger, which he killed after a desperate struggle. Arrived at Dead Indian at 340 and camped at the foot of Dead Indian Hill traveled about 11 miles, obtained six pounds of butter and two quarts of milk at Inlow's camp. Evenings spent in playing whist, checkers, and in singing and playing, retired at 11.30, considerably fatigued. Friday, August 9th, arose at 4.30 a.m. Professor Watt and Everett took one early hunt, got only one rabbit apiece, had a fine breakfast and plenty of new milk. Renewed journey at 9 a.m. At Neal's Ranch, we obtained a gallon of buttermilk, which Professor Watt and the ladies greatly relished. Then we took the wrong road and went five miles out of our way. In attempting to take a shortcut when returning, we again took the wrong road and went two miles further out of the way. Got on the right road at three o'clock. The road was terribly rough and riding extremely tiresome. Though all were somewhat disheartened and disappointed at our misfortunes, all were jubilant after we found a good camp on the right road and our pleasure was greatly intensified rather than marred by our mistake. He shall rejoice most 
who endureth misfortunes most nobly. Saturday, August 10th. Roads terrible, the worst yet passed over. Reached Lake of the Woods at 2.30. The water was very scarce along the road and not very good at the campground near the lake. Forest fires raging and smoke very dense. At this point, Lynn gives us a note about Lake of the Woods and Mount Pitt. Lake of the Woods is nearly directly east of Jacksonville and about five miles from Mount Pitt. It is about three miles long and one mile wide and is surrounded by a sandy beach of considerable width. At present, the lake is lower than ever before known. No stream of much size runs into it or from it. But its water is furnished by the rains and snows and by numerous springs in and about the lake. It is considered one of the prettiest lakes in Oregon. Mount Pitt, known to us today as Mount McLaughlin, could not be seen on account of the dense smoke. It is about 10,000 feet high and is usually either wholly or partly covered with snow. This year, the snow entirely disappeared. Mount Pitt and the scenery surrounding Lake of the Woods are grand and picturesque when the atmosphere is clear. We rode twice along the beach or shore, then pitched camp near the lake at 5 p.m. Had a grand hot supper. A party of three from Ashland were camped beside us, with whom we had a pleasant visit and social time. Found plenty of good feed for the horses and a huckleberry patch near camp. Intending to stay at Lake of the Woods several days, we arranged camp very orderly and prepared to take a good rest and have a jolly time on the lake shore. Retired at 11.30. Sunday, August 11th. A prohibitory law was established and enforced by Miss Carrie Beekman, who had previously been formally designated president of our party, forbidding hunting, shooting, traveling, or anything not agreeable to the proper observance of the Sabbath, or which would seem in the least disrespectful to him who affords us our pleasure. So, we arose rather late and had breakfast at nine. After breakfast, a general cleanup of persons was indulged in, the men retiring to the lake to take a bath while the ladies held possession of camp. Everett further proved his skill in all things by efficient manner in which he manipulated the razor, while Cap, not wishing to be outdone, skillfully managed the curling iron for the ladies. Soon the ladies presented themselves arrayed in attire fit for any occasion, even the most exalted, uh, while the men came forth in the best they had carried with them. All having congregated, the third and fourth chapters of John, the fifth chapter of James, and the last chapter of Revelation are read by Miss President. And sweet by and by, home sweet home, nearer my God to thee, and other hymns were sung by the party. A fine dinner was then prepared with huckleberry pie for dessert. This afternoon was spent pleasantly in singing, playing, musical instruments, talking, joking. At six o'clock, we took our musical instruments and all went for a stroll along the beach visited a camp of old pioneers about a mile from our camp and stayed two hours, played and sang for them and spent the evening quite pleasantly. Then having spent the Sabbath in the mountains in a civilized and quite praiseworthy manner, we retired about 10.30. Everett suspected something wrong in the actions of Carrie, Nina, and Kubley and retired dressed with his shoes ready for an emergency during the night. Monday, August 12th. Storms and hurricanes raged at about 1 a.m. and all but Carrie, Nina, and Kubli 
suffered severely from them. After rising late, some retaliatory measures were adopted by those who were the victims of the storms and hurricanes, which were dis but they were discovered before being carried out, even though they were successful in producing the desired effect. Several good jokes were carried out quite effectively and all taken good-naturedly. This being the 19th anniversary of Miss Nina's birth, it was agreeable to all to celebrate in birthday style. A fine dinner was prepared and a good old-fashioned candy pulling was indulged in in the evening and the event observed in a most commendable manner. Singing and playing and games of various kinds were enjoyed and no pains were spared to make Nina's birthday in the mountains, one which she will always remember with extreme pleasure. Retired about 11, at which time the song, I'll forgive but never forget, was appropriately sung and well rendered by the ladies. Tuesday, August 13th. We arose about six and began to load our wagons and prepare to leave. Passed slowly along the lake shore and took our last glance at the lake and our campground. Everett and Professor Watt, inspired by the grandeur of the lake, no doubt, wandered too near the water with the provision wagon and soon found themselves stuck in the mud. Soon enough, the wagon was free. The road was very rough, yet much better than some we had previously passed over. Having been advised to visit Stidham's about six miles off the main road, we directed our course thitherward. Not finding a good camping place there, we turned toward Pelican Bay on the main road and about 14 miles from Lake of the Woods. Obtained six pounds of fine butter on the road to the bay. Pelican Bay is a very pretty body of water furnished by large springs at the foothills. It is an arm of Klamath Lake. The woods surrounding the bay abound in game and furnish fine timber. Our camp here was rather dusty and disagreeable, yet had a fine time. Professor Watt, Carey, and Miss Brayman went from the bay into the lake in a boat, and Everett, Cap, and Nina were boating several times. I didn't get to go at any time. Wednesday, August 14th. Everett and I arose early and took a long hunt, but saw nothing. Spent the day in boating and otherwise having a good time. The evening was spent very pleasantly in singing and playing and otherwise amusing ourselves. Professor Watt further added to the amusements of the evening by some contortions and gymnastics exercises, while the ladies plainly evinced their knowledge and appreciation of operatic dramatic skill by rendering several fine selections of that character. Thursday, August 15th. Arose at six and proceeded in our journey at nine. The road was extremely rough and all four horses had to be hitched to draw the wagon to the summit of a divide about a mile from the bay. The scenery as we passed along the road is quite picturesque. Passed many campers and camps along the road. Arrived at Cherry Creek and we found the finest camp we have yet had so arranged everything very orderly and conveniently as we intend to remain over Sunday. Retired rather early. Friday, August 16th. Everett and I arose and started on a hunt at five. I killed a fine grouse while returning to camp and Everett later killed one in camp. In the afternoon, Professor Watts and I went to a large spring about two miles from camp to fish, but we gathered shells upon the Klamath Marsh instead, found six or eight varieties of fine freshwater shells. In the evening, when we went to tie up our horses for the night as usual, we found that they'd started homeward. We searched for them until it was too dark to see plainly. Though the thoughts that our horses had left us rather shrouded our camp in gloom, we spent the evening cheerfully and pleasantly, allowing nothing to mar our pleasures. 
Saturday, August 17th. Professor Watt and I arose at five, started in search of the horses. We tracked them along the road towards home and found them about four miles from camp. Had breakfast at nine, after which Everett Cap and I went fishing and Professor Watt went hunting, leaving the camp in charge of the ladies at their request. Professor Watt returned with one grouse, Everett Kubley and I returned with 156 fine trout. Had a fine supper with plenty of fish and spent the evening sociable. Ate cookies and cakes and drank lemonade. Clouded up late in the evening and threatened to rain, but no rain fell. The horses were restless all night. Sunday, it's Sunday again, August 18th. The prohibitory law was again enforced, but not so stringent as last Sunday, permitting some necessary work to be performed. It was rather windy and chilly all day. Smoke entirely disappeared and thus afforded us the pleasure of the surrounding scenery. The horses got loose again, and we had quite a chase before catching them. After the morning's work was completed, all congregated, and the fifth chapter of Matthew, the fifteenth chapter of John, and the first thirteen verses of the twelfth chapter of Hebrews were read and hymns sung. A fine dinner was then prepared, the most extensive bill of fare we had yet had. The afternoon and evening were spent in singing and playing and having a good social time while we all took a good rest preparatory to the renewal of our journey on the morrow. Cherry Creek is a fine specimen of a mountain stream. About 12 miles from Fort Klamath, it's very clear and quite cold. The prairie along the lower part of the creek furnished very good grazing for horses, and the scenery along the creek and the surroundings is quite pleasing, though not picturesque. Monday, August 19th, arose at 6 and renewed the journey at 9. Roads for about 3 miles were quite rough and the woods adjoining were all afire. The rest of the road was smooth, scenery the grandest we had yet viewed. Mountains surrounding the Wood River Valley and Klamath Marsh are indeed picturesque. The atmosphere was very clear. Arrived at Wood River at 1.30, where we ate lunch and fed the horses. Then went to the fort. Fort Klamath was built by my father during the Indian Trouble in 1864. It's about 100 miles from Jacksonville. It was abandoned last Thursday, August 15, 1889. So we were deprived of the pleasure of seeing the soldiers in their drills. Only 13 officers and soldiers are now stationed at the fort, and it seemed entirely deserted. Guns and everything were even removed. We rode by the graveyard and all the buildings of the fort and passed near the formwork of the scaffold on which Captain Jack and other Indians were hung. At the fort, we mailed several letters, sent telegrams announcing our arrival there, and laid in a few necessary supplies. I hope they didn't buy more sugar. At any rate, we continued on our way and arrived at Annie Creek at 5.30, where we found a fine camping place. Purchased hay for the horses along the road, had a fine time in the evening, and retired at all hours from 11 to 1. Tuesday, August 20th, arose at 7 and continued at our journey at 9. I was suddenly taken sick and felt the effect of it through the day. We passed along Annie Creek Canyon, which afforded some of the grandest and most picturesque scenery in Southern Oregon. Along the canyon are many perpendicular cliffs, two or 300 feet in height, which are all grand. We played the cornet and listened with intense interest to the sound echoing and reverberating between the precipitous walls. The canyon has been washed out by a comparatively small stream and in some places reaches the depth of nearly 700 feet. 
The walls of the canyons are composed of pumice stone, in some places standing upon the inclined walls like pyramids or needles. This was the most interesting day we had yet spent and prepared us for the grand Crater Lake scenery which we were about to witness. Met many Indians during the day returning from the Huckleberry Patch at Whiskey Creek, seven miles from Crater Lake. Passed quite a party from Phoenix camped two and a half miles below the lake and another party from Grants Pass two miles below the lake. Later found a party from Talent. Arrived at a fine camp one and a half miles from Crater Lake at six o'clock where we arranged things for a few days stay. After supper, Carrie was suddenly taken sick with a severe nervous chill and was quite ill during the evening. However, we spent the evening quite pleasantly in singing and otherwise having a good social time. Being considerably exhausted from our day's ride, we retired earlier than usual, intending to visit the lake on the morrow. Wednesday, August 21st. Arose with the intention of visiting the lake, but after breakfast, Carrie was again taken with a violent, nervous chill, which was followed by three others, and in the afternoon, two more. So we abandoned visiting the lake and remained in camp during the day. Found a fine huckleberry patch near camp and gathered a lot during the day. Retired with a feeling that all would be ready to take the climb the next morning. Thursday, August 22nd. Arose at 4.30 had an early breakfast, and all went to the lake. The ladies riding in a light wagon with Everett driving the team. The rest walked. Reached the lake just after sunrise, but the view of the lake was greatly obstructed by the smoke. However, the scene was grand. Cap and I went down to the water to see if the trail was in proper condition for the ladies to undertake the descent and found it safe yet venturesome. We returned and met the rest of the party halfway and assisted the ladies the rest of the way. Soon after we reached the lake shore, 1600 feet below the point from which we had gazed in wonder. We were joined by the party from Talent. After remaining at the water's edge for about two hours, and carving our names and initials in the most conspicuous places, we commenced the ascent of the precipitous walls and reached the summit one and a half hours later. After returning to camp and having a good hot supper, we talked over our day's adventure, grateful indeed to our protector for thus having so safely led us in a perilous adventure. Friday, August 23rd. Arose late and found it cloudy with heavy mist falling and the smoke almost disappeared. After breakfast, all but Carrie and Nina went to the huckleberry patch about a half mile from camp and gathered about six gallons of berries. As the smoke had cleared away, all but Carrie and I went to the lake at various times during the day and had a grand view of the lake. Carrie deemed it politic for her to take a good rest all day preparatory to the renewal of our journey on the morrow. We retired about 10. Saturday, August 24th. Arose about 5 and began to prepare to proceed on our way and direct our course homeward. After breakfast, Carrie and I took the light wagon and went to have a last look at the lake. Leaving, we passed along Castle Canyon had a very good view from the wagons, met 92 Indians returning from the Huckleberry Patch at Whiskey Creek, ate lunch and fed the horses at Union Creek at 1.30. Mm, no Beckys then though. Passed through some very dense and fine timber. The road from the lake to the falls was grand. Arrived at Rogue River Falls at 5 p.m. Having had a long, dusty ride during the day, we retired shortly after having supper and singing a few of our favorite songs. Sunday, August 25th. We arose about 7 o'clock 
and after having breakfast, all went to the falls to spend the day. Had a fine time at the falls and highly appreciated the grand scenery. The falls are formed by a small stream known as Mill Creek, falling over a precipice 196 feet high. They are pretty, though quite small, and form an object of interest and attraction to sightseers. Rogue River Rapids, formed by the river rushing madly down a steep incline between lofty banks and over huge boulders, is equally as grand and picturesque. Remember, this is Sunday. This is a different Sunday. After a stay at the falls, we returned to camp where we built two fine campfires and after supper spent the evening in our usual social manner. During the evening, there were readings from Romans and Peter 1 and 2. How different this is from the first Sunday. Monday, August 26th, arose early and renewed our journey at 7.30. Killed some quail and gray squirrels on the way. One horse nearly gave out and made us very late in reaching Jackson's, our camping place. Camped in the midst of 60 acres of melons and were told to help ourselves. After doing so and feasting highly, all but the girls retired. It being our last night out, they were bent upon having a good time and were up until nearly one o'clock. They sang, chatted, and feasted upon melons and had a merry time. Tuesday, August 27th, the last day. After breakfast, we rode through the melon patch, loaded our wagons with 15 of the largest melons we could find, and directed our course homeward. Ate dinner on Rogue River near the bridge. That's Bybee Bridge today, and it's located um, on Table Rock Road near Tudeville Park. Reached home at five. The thoughts of our reunion to be held on Thursday night somewhat cheers us, and another one of our good old times is generally anticipated. And they did get together just two evenings later at Carrie Beekman's house. Thursday, August 29th. All assembled at Carrie's fine home and spent the evening very pleasantly in reviewing our grand trip and enjoying our mountain jokes. A grand banquet was prepared for us and immensely enjoyed. Appropriate and impressive toasts were given and an evening spent long to be remembered. Thus ends Fletcher Lynn's account. Each of the six signed the diary, presumably that night. Let's hear what they said, and I'll tell you what became of them. Carrie Beekman hoped, the pleasures of our Crater Lake trip will never be effaced from memory. She went on to play piano in the Presbyterian Church of Jacksonville and gave lessons in the Beekman home to many youngsters. Later, she traveled in Europe and the East Coast, cared for her parents as they aged, and eventually lived in Portland with her brother. Her Jacksonville home is the Beekman House Museum today. Nina Beekman remarked, my trip to Crater Lake always, will always be remembered as among the pleasantest and most enjoyable times spent in Oregon. She later married Leland Ernest and lived out her life in Dundee, New York, where she was active in the Presbyterian Church. Anna Brayman poetically stated, Friendship which flows from the heart cannot be frozen by adversity as the water which flows from the spring does not congeal in winter. She would marry Rudolf Prahl in 1894. He was a china and crystal importer. They were married 52 years and Anna lived to be 103. Caspar Kubley said, may we all meet again and enjoy happiness equal to that enjoyed in our past trip. He would go to Harvard Law School. He was a natural athlete and could have gone with the Boston Athletic Club to the first modern Olympic Games, but he didn't. He came home to Jacksonville where he was a lawyer, a minor, and served seven terms in the state legislature 
including one as Speaker in 1933. Everett Mingus wrote, May this pleasure be again. He studied medicine and remained a highly respected and well-known doctor in Marshfield, Oregon for most of his life. George Watt just signed his name. He later became professor of pharmacy at Washington State College in Pullman, Washington, and the proprietor of a drugstore there. Fletcher Lynn, our chronicler, writes a note in the diary much later when he apparently is sending it to Carrie. Tell Carrie to keep in mind that this account was written by a schoolboy 52 years ago. He had gone on into the furniture manufacturing business in Eugene and Portland and was a financier and president of Portland Cement and Pacific Coast Linen Mills. He was active in the Portland Chamber of Commerce and became a trustee of Lewis and Clark College, the YMCA, and the Oregon Historical Society. Though they saw many interesting and picturesque sites and ended up many miles apart, the camaraderie experienced by all surely would be with them for many years to come. Thank you for sharing this diary with me today, and thanks to the Southern Oregon Historical Society for the use of many of the photos, the diary, and the map. So thank you for coming and joining us this evening. And open your eyes. Remember, history is everywhere.